Welcome to Money Metaphors, exploring financial concepts through stories and analogies with Jason Coddington from Coddington Wealth Advisors. In this podcast, we help families and small business owners like you navigate the world of finance. Our goal? To help you stress less and enjoy life more, all while leaving a lasting legacy. Join us for this journey where we explore the nuances of goal-based asset management, retirement, and estate planning strategies as Jason and his team draw from years of expertise and guest experts to solve the puzzle of effective financial management. Hello, and welcome to Money Metaphors with Jason Coddington. Jason, good to be with you. How are you doing these days? Good, good. You know, year end, so that's always busy for us, you know, strategies, you know, uh, with taxes, looking at what opportunities can we take advantage of before the year end. So that's always, it's always a busy time. Fun time too, though, because it's it's my favorite time of year, Christmas time and celebrating with family and stuff. So that's, it's all good. It is all good. It is a bit ironic though, as we cruise on into the holidays, it's a really, really busy time for, for you and the folks that work for you. And also, I guess it's a time to stop, pause, reflect, and start thinking about 2024. Yeah. What might lie ahead. Yeah. And you really have to, I mean... Yeah, you, you reflect a little bit, and then that's what we're going to do today is look look forward and look at some topics and trends that might be appearing in 2024. So hopefully today, by listening to this, you'll be able to take some action on some concepts we talk about today. So let's get started. What do we need okay. to do? Where do we start? Well, so, well, before we get into the, you know, the the 2024 outlook or forecast, we want to make first and foremost, and just revisit this, that it's absolutely important that you have a plan first. And so all the the topics we discussed today that, you know, they're, they're made or they're strategies that should be in alignment with a long-term financial plan. I think in our first podcast, we talked about having, you know, money in smart places, not necessarily the smartest place. So, you know, that being said, when we talk about some of the strategies and topics today, that's going to be always part, it's important to always be part of a long-term financial plan. And, you know, right now, I know another phrase that we like to use with individuals is, you know, we prefer what has always worked Mm -hmm. versus what might seem to be working right now. So sound strategies are always going to be important. So staying invested, stay diversified, rebalance follow your financial plan. And then most importantly is, you know, short-term goals should probably be in cash. So zero to two years, medium-term goals, intermediate, basically three to seven years, probably bonds will make some sense. And then of course, long-term is always stocks or equities. And so just whatever we to talk the rest of the day, that just keep that in mind. And if you don't have a financial plan, call us because it's going to be important to get one because we think yeah. as economy, taxes, all of that changes, you can stay focused when you have a plan. The example we use, I think before is when they have a flight plan and a pilot gets on a plane and, you know, they have the, their, the both the pilot and the co-pilot are looking over the, uh, the flight plan and they look, okay, well, here's where we need to go. Here's our route. Here's the jet stream we're going to follow. That's their plan. But, you know, once they're in the air, things change and they probably deviate from that, you know, 90 percent of the time, but they still land at the destination on time. So even though the plans don't go always as ex- expected, it's good to have a plan. So can't specify that enough. But with that said, we probably can jump into uh, some of the topics and we can start with the economy. So if we want to start. Oh, there, yeah. Is it good? You, you started with a little caveat of like the plan is what's important because economically speaking and the economy, I've been doing this for a really, really long time. You can get 10 different opinions on the economy if you talk to 10 different economists. But we're not looking at it from an economist standpoint. We're looking at it from a financial planning standpoint. And so guide us through this one. What do you see? Yeah. Well, I think, you know, a couple of things with the economy is, you know, on the radar, there's been this this conversation about a recession, right? So that's looking like it's likely in 2024. And First off, just kind of redefine what that a recession is. I mean, clinically, a recession is two consecutive quarters of zero or negative growth in the economy. Right. They expect that to be mild. We had a recession. And by the way, speaking of forecasts, going back to 2019, no one expected the geopolitical event of COVID. Uh, no <laughs> one was predicting that in 2019, and it happened in 2020. So everybody had to adjust. But Speaking of of COVID in 2020, you know, that was a very steep decline, recession, if you will, and a very rapid 
recovery. So that all happened within six months. So that being said, you know, we see a, a, a mild recession probably on the rise. You know, we'll talk a little bit about how that impacts stocks and bonds and other things, but we see that interest rates, the Fed has already indicated that they're likely to decrease uh, interest rates. So that's a good news for stocks and it's good news for consumers because borrowing costs less now. And if you also, if you're an owner of a business, you're your debt service or your interest payments cost less now. So that's good. And then, you know, we'll talk a little about bonds and the impact with interest rates a little bit later. And then, you know, probably the big thing is, you know, unless again, who knows geopolitical events, but risk, you know, inflation looks like it's going to, is continuing to damper. It's slowing down. You know, we went from, you know, 2021, quite a large increase in, you know, in costs. And then uh, again, not back to where we were in, you know, the 2020 levels, but inflation is looking to settle and calm down, which is which is a good thing because things cost less. And that's all good news well, for the economy. Yeah, hopefully they cost less. Let's keep our fingers yeah. crossed that they right, do. right. And oh well we were in Texas uh, a couple months ago and visiting and you know it's just hard from someone from California when the price of gas is over five bucks and then you see the price of gas in Texas under three dollars so you can say whatever you want there uh the big thing there the big difference is of course tax yep. so yes some things will cost less some things but on the whole the consumer price index should be less we see that and that's good news for consumers that means they'll have more spending spending ability typically that's more purchasing power or savings which is all good for the capital markets. What does it mean, Jason, in terms of like looking ahead and looking at the stock market? What do you expect or how should we approach planning for that? Yeah, I think, well, you know, it's had a good run this year uh, in 2023. Mm -hmm. So the S&P 500 has done, you know, really well. The, you know, the lower interest rates and the cooling of inflation, you know, that's, that's good news. If you're a stock investor, you like, you like those, that's a good environment to be operating in lower interest rates and lower inflation. That's a normal example. And then I think what, if you look at the overall stock market, I think, you know, the past year, you know, we've had a double digit return. I think you're probably going to see, you know, from the economists. And again, you mentioned those, all those economists. I mean, here's a, here's my uh, equivalent of Rush Limbaugh's stack of stuff, right? I mean, <laughs> uh, on the economy and forecast. So you kind of absorb a lot of information and basically it's likely that, you know, we're, it's not going to sustain a double digit you know, return. It's going to be a mild, mild growth for 2000, for 2024. And, you know, with that, there are certain sectors that, you know, are going to look in styles that are going to probably do, are likely favorable in this environment. So growth type, large growth stocks tend to do well mm -hmm. um, in the environment when, you know, large companies, you know, the Apples, the Microsofts, the Walmarts, you know, the larger big blue chip companies tend to do well. Of course, Walmart's not a large growth stock, but you know, the bigger companies are going to be going to do well in so this environment. Just to differentiate, you're talking about large cap, not small cap or mid cap stocks. Yeah. Yeah. We're not saying avoid small cap, but you know, <laughs> large cap, you know, is probably looks, this is their environment. It looks like they're going to okay. do the best in this environment. Small caps, if, you know, interest rates are even lower, small caps would have probably look more favorable, but in the environment we're in, you know, large company growth stocks. And we're not saying abandon all the, we're not saying abandon the current portfolio. We're just saying that's what looks to do best. Yeah. And I think the other, other thing to consider is, you know, the Middle East and Europe, you know, there continues to just be unrest and, and lack of stability there. And so, yeah. you know, we see there, we see choppiness in those markets. You know, if you look at, if you're international, you know, just be aware of that. If you have, if you're not getting the same returns as you're getting in the U.S., doesn't necessarily mean abandon international, but just know that there's going to be, there's some headwinds there mm. just because of, you know, the events that are going on. And, you know, ultimately to kind of summarize the stock section is, you know, you know, LPL financial, you know, our broker dealer, you know, they placed a target on the S and P 500, which is, you know, the 500 largest stocks right. in the United States, you know, they have a, a value target of about price target of, you know, 4,850 on the S and P 500 next year. So that, you know, it's still, that's within that alignment of that single digit, you know, growth forecast. So again, just a forecast, but you know, that's, we see kind of a normal non-volatile year. Now I will say that one thing that 
we'll get into a little bit is there is we are going into an election year. <laughs> so um, you noticed, huh? <laughs> yes. So that uh that will start heating things up and there'll be some there'll be some uh some volatility based on news and prospects about the election. But yes. I think historically speaking, uh the data backs us up that you know stock markets are somewhat impervious to presidents and congresses. You know, they they earn and they produce irrespective of who's in there. Some have more favorable policies, but, you know, you could some people would argue the conservatives or the Republicans are pro business. But if you go back and look, that might be the case politically. But if you go back and look at some of the best returns in history, wasn't always that way. So, you know, I think a lot of people get wrapped up on, you know, in the political side and the impact of stocks when it's just not that important. It does matter for public policy, like when it talks about taxes. And so. Yeah. The, out, the outcome of the ere- election with Congress, if the Republicans can get control of the of Congress, you know, have mm-hmm. both both houses there, the Senate and the House, then, you know, that's likely that they're not going to mess too much with tax policy. And that's positive for stocks. So but we'll just have to wait and see, because as you've known with elections, at least the last two stranger things have happened. So, oh, God. Yeah. I mean, I just could say better to put your money and invest in stocks and you can take a bet. On the election is a separate kind of action right. entirely. But yeah, <laughs> right. you but you mentioned it won't be a, you you don't expect double digit gains like we've seen this year. But one of the criticisms of the market so far has been that a lot of the gains have been concentrated in a small number of stocks this year. Do you think we're going to see a broader kind of? I'm going to use the word rally because you you see gains being made over the year. Do you see a broader kind of advance in the market? Yeah, I see that. I don't see, I mean, there's been a lot of profit, you know, there's been a lot of profit from seven of the largest companies in the S&P 500. Yeah. You know, they're, they're calling them the Magnificent Seven. You know, and if you strip away their return, you know, for 2023, you know, the performance isn't as as good. Yeah. So we do see, we do see that broadening because we don't feel that seven can carry the other 393 uh, excuse me, 493 that much longer. <laughs> there you go. That much longer. Yeah. Too much math this morning. <laughs> yeah, Lord. Well, speaking of math, we wander once again into the bond market. Yeah. What do you see ahead there? Yeah, bonds, I, you know, we we talked, we've talked about this in with our clients a lot in the past uh month. And last week the Fed, you know, has indicated that they're going to they're likely going to drop rates. They're not going they don't see increases and they're likely going to drop them. Now does that mean that they're not going to raise them? There could be an environment in which they raise them. If for some reason inflation raises its ugly head, they will likely raise rates. But that just, you know, highly unlikely. And when you have a, the president of the or the leader of the Federal Open Market Committee stating that interest rates are likely going to cool off and decline, that's to be expected. What does that mean for bonds? Well, there's this teeter-totter effect with bonds where price and yield are are inversely related. So mm-hmm. if interest rates are to drop, that means that prices of bonds are going to go up. So if you own bonds now and prices and yields um, go down, prices go up, you're going to see capital appreciation in your bonds. Mm. So we're going to suggest, you know, and so take that, we're almost at an all-time high in the stock market, right? You know, what looks good there for bonds is, you know, highly, you know, investment grade. So, you know, triple B or better, longer term, and then agency bonds, you know, or government bonds. So, you know, if you, again, that 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 teeter-totter, that inverse relationship between price and yield, the longer the maturity, the more capital appreciation you might see. But, and I think what's most welcome with interest rates declining is we're going to be in an environment where we'll be in a normal place. And what do I mean by normal place is that interest rates will be higher than it ultimately getting to a place where old interest rates are higher than inflation. So at least if you're going to stick your your neck out there and hold, you know, have a maturity of uh, yeah five to six years, you can get paid a real return. You know, earlier last year with inflation at 8% and yields at 3%, you're going back 6%. <laughs> you yeah, you were losing yes. money, yes, indeed. Yeah, safely safely losing money. So that's uh, our purchasing power rather. So that's, um, we like that. We like, you know, market capital markets like sound concepts and beliefs. And so yields over inflation is good. Lower interest rates, lower inflation. Uh, excuse me, lower inflation is good. And so that's that's a good environment. 
Yeah. And so bonds are for the first time in, and cash for that matter, you know, money market accounts are paying right. many of them north of 3%. Some you can find still on the fives. Those will come down though, as interest rates drop. Good in, good environment overall. I mean, it's interesting how this seesaw works. Uh, you know, 2022, last year, for the first time in many, many years, both the stock market and the bond market had double digit return or negative returns. So, you know, usually one goes one way, one goes the other. That's why you're you're theoretically diversified. But, you know, last year a balanced fund was balanced, but it balanced negative. <laughs> Excuse me. Yes, you. Thanks so much for listening to the Money Metaphors podcast. We hope you're enjoying it so far. If you have any questions or would like to talk more about this topic, you can find us at CoddingtonWealthAdvisors.com. And all of our social media platforms are listed in the show notes. And by, last year, just so we're, just, and by last year, just so we're clear, we're talking, you mean by 20,000? 20, yeah, 2000. sorry, uh, 2022. And so now going into 2024, you know, now stocks are positive last year and it's, it looks like in an environment based, at least on the outlook, that you could be going into a place where you've got some positive momentum for bonds and positive momentum for stocks. So, oh, that's nice. So for those bal- that balanced portfolio, that's a good place. That's a good place to be. And that's important if you're, you know, near retirement or in retirement because you've got diversification and you got a little bit of both. And so that's not. Well, it's been but- really, really hard. I got to tell you, it's been really hard, I think, for a lot of people to be diversified in the classic sense of, you know, 60 stocks, 40 bonds, because they've looked at the bond market and thought, man, it's a mess. And it, until, until the very end of 2023 bonds were not a good place to be. So it sounds like you believe we're entering a point where we're going to return to a more historically normal time where stocks are attractive and bonds offer a reasonable hedge. Yeah, and and I think the key there the point you made about, you know, not earning so much in bonds is you know, if you wanted income in your portfolio, you kind of had to stick your neck out for risk, whether that be you know in in high yielding uh, you know dividends stocks, or if you had to go up you know go down the investment quality you know either you know low grade corporate bonds to get your yield. And so when you do that, you stick your neck out for more income. But now as interest as you know interest rates have been high, but now they're starting to come down again. You start you still get still get in a place where there's some yield. You know it's we're not down to you know one or two percent on the ten year treasury like we were a few years ago. So yeah. there's you don't have to stick your neck out there to get as much income as you did a few years ago. And that's that's positive for people because most clients like to achieve goals with less risk, right? So, you know, I mean, I I, I do. Well, so. I sure do. Yeah, that would be nice. Yeah, yeah. that would, less risk, better return. That that's a good equation. I like yeah. that one. That's well, the- you mentioned we're in a we're in an election year, and yeah, it's really easy to get distracted by rhetoric in election during election time. But there is some speculation out there that with interest rates having risen back to more historically normal norms, what it has done is increase the cost of government because people forget that we have a massive, massive federal deficit that we have to fund. And so there's some speculation that there is no way we're getting around increased taxes. I don't know where you stand on this. And if that's true, let's just say for a second it is possibly true. Is there a way to plan for that? Yeah, I think, unfortunately, I mean, yeah, we are spending way too much money. I mean, if you want to staggering, if you're just kind of bored and you want to stagger yourself, do this around the, do this around the 1st of March is go into an Excel program and just type in, you know, like $5 trillion, right? So that's, that's 12 zeros. And then just figure out how to divide that by the number of seconds there are in a year. And you'll find that it's, it's quite staggering. I mean, in just the time we've talked here, we spent a few million dollars. So our government is extraordinarily large and the cost and the amount of borrowing we have is is extraordinarily is large as well. And so, you know, a good portion of our budget is paying off the debt on stuff from previous years where we overspent. However, where I see the issue on that is there has to be tax policy. I understand that. I think where there needs to be an extraordinarily difficult debate in Washington, one such as, you know, almost almost as, as emphatic as to the founding of our country, yeah. 
there needs to be a debate on how much we spend because this this cannot sustain future generations. I don't have any grandchildren yet, but you know, I'm I'm concerned about I'm concerned about this level of of spending and borrowing that the federal government does without any accountability. And so, but I do think there's going to be pressure for tax incentives. You know, I'm I'm a supply sider, so <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no. But but uh, that it doesn't matter. I just I don't care what the outcome is. Let's just have an honest debate about. It. You just can't keep spending more than you make. Right. And at the same time, I understand there's going to have to be some concessions on raising some some taxes. But you know, the last time I think we had a a, a, cons- a surplus, and I think Bill Clinton was our president. Clinton Bill was Clinton was in office you know? when the last and, time we had a budget surplus, a, a yearly budget surplus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. And I think. Uh, and then, of course, you know, the Republicans were in Congress, so it was mixed government. That was when the last time we had a surplus. You know, we need to get back to that. We need to try and get I mean, back. That was back when we had a healthy political dynamic in the country where, you know, people didn't hate each other because of the D or the R in front of their names. So it, was a, yeah. it was a different yeah. time. You know, it was a very different time. But I am curious because now we're talking about this and I'm thinking, well, OK, if if and my fingers are crossed on this, we can have a grown up conversation about how much we spend because it's way overdue and, and we need to be having that conversation. I don't care where you fall on the political spectrum. That conversation's right, right. overdue. Okay. And, you know, what we do about it in terms of sp- spending less and maybe raising interest rates and stuff, it's a little unsettling. I mean, would you, are you maybe suggesting to some of your clients that, you know, that some tax free investments might be attractive to them? Yeah. At this point? Yeah. If taxes, yeah. So, you know, that's a nice thing with interest rates coming down. You could look at, and then the bond side of things, you know, their municipal bonds and specific treasuries, you know, offer tax free you know, benefits to clients. If you invest in those, you know, you don't get the yield as you would on a taxable investment, but if right. you don't pay, pay tax, and many times if you're in the high tax bracket, your tax equivalent yield can be quite significant, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, so we do advocate for that, looking at that, but everybody's tax situation is different. But yeah, municipals do play do play a part or tax freeze, if you will, in a, in yeah. a person's portfolio, especially in the non-taxable or excuse me, in the, in the taxable account, such as, you know, a regular account. You know, you don't necessarily, sure. you, can, you can debate whether they should be involved in like retirement accounts. You know, that's very, you know, usually a, a standard bond municipal doesn't necessarily need to be in a in an IRA, but if they're in a non IRA account, yeah, municipals make sense. Well, so especially in those higher we brackets. To, so we get close to wrapping this up, Jason. Uh, let's let's kind of wrap it up for everybody in terms of what do you see ahead and what do you think people should do. So yeah, Bill, kind of to wrap it up, just looking at bonds look to a favorable place, right? Because the interest rates look to fall. So yeah. stocks have done really well in the past. Uh, you know, twelve to 14 months. So you have this unique pocket of time where it makes sense to rebalance your portfolio. And if you haven't done that, I would strongly encourage you to look at your portfolio and look at perhaps locking in some of the profits you've made over the past few years. And, uh, you know, the bond market at its current level, using that example of the, you know, the inverse relationship between price and yield provides an attractive place to rebalance those stock profits too. So we would say that, I would say if you refinanced in 2023, early 2023, and you have one of those higher interest rates and interest rates continue to decline, you may have the opportunity to refinance uh, at a better price. So, you know, again, that's something you got to work out Mm. with, you know, mortgage banker and do the math. Uh, We can help with that too. Uh, We can't do the loan, but we can at least help you with the math, but that might be, you know, a good opportunity for folks in 2024. You know, the election year, it's likely that, uh, you know, it's still going to be mixed government. We don't know what that looks like. There's, there's, you know, again, you can pick up different reports and find out who thinks <laughs> who's going to win. It's not likely that tax policy is going to change too much. So that's good. So, you know, again, you know, not, again, who knows, but, you know, we don't, we're not fearful of a major tax change, you know, with the election year. Yeah. And I think the other piece is that, you know, if you haven't looked at your portfolio and rebalanced it, I think that's important. I think it's look at your style. Are you overweight? You know, a few stocks, if you own individual stocks, do you just own the, you know, the top seven? You know, those are all keys. You know, I think again, to kind of reiterate, the economy looks stable, possibly a soft to mild recession. Bonds are, we're in a normal environment where bonds are look likely going to earn more than inflation. And I think most important is just again, take all these strategies in and place it on your financial plan. And, you know, keep in mind that, you know, short-term 
Short-term goals require short-term money and long-term goals require long-term investments. Well, for the people who are listening to this conversation and are thinking, maybe I should do something about my portfolio and I'm not quite sure what to do, and they want to reach out to you, how do they get a hold of you? Yeah, they can call us at uh, 559-897-0040. We're in California, so we're on you know the high tax state, <laughs> <laughs> so Pacific Standard Time. And we can just do, you know, a real non-evasive portfolio review just to see, you know, where you're at and what opportunities might be ahead for you in your portfolio, you know, in your portfolio. You can also go to our website and check out our resources there. There'll also be some links in the podcast notes as well. And you have the ability to go onto our website. If you like what you see, you want to book an appointment with us, you can do it right there. Just uh, you can click the top right-hand corner and uh, we'll get together and we'll see how we might be able to help you. Good. Good deal. Thank you, Jason. Appreciate it. All right. Look, looking ahead to 2024, folks, reach out to Jason. The other thing you can do that's even easier is hit subscribe. If you're not a subscriber to this podcast already, that way you will never miss another episode of these conversations. It's easy. It's simple. Do it. And if you like it, we'd humbly ask that maybe you give it a review and share it with other people to help spread the word about the podcast. On behalf of Jason and everybody at Coddington Wealth, I'm Bill Tucker urging you to remember to go out and live your very best life now, today. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Money Metaphors, exploring financial concepts through stories and analogies. Visit our website at www.coddingtonwealthadvisors.com or give us a call at 559-897-0040. Don't forget to click the follow button to be notified when new episodes become available.